Thank you. Welcome everyone to the TSC weekly call. Uh, so I will uh, go through the usual spiel, especially given that we have a few new people to the TSC call. I have to tell you that this is a public call. Anyone is welcome to join and contribute. However, there are two conditions to doing so. The first one is to be aware and live by the antitrust policy, the notice of which is currently displayed on your screen, at least on the Zoom meetings uh, window. And the other piece is the code of conduct, which uh, governs all of hyperledger activities, uh, which is also linked from the agenda. So with that taken care of, we can move forward with the agenda. First, we will start with the series of announcements. And um, just uh, as a preview, in case for, you know, people haven't seen it, the agenda today, we will spend a bit of time um, dedicated to a presentation from some colleagues of mine that have uh, recently launched a new lab, uh, which has to do with interoperability. So, but before we get there, let's uh, go through the usual announcements and quarterly reports. So first there's the usual reminder. There is the Hyperledger weekly developer newsletter. Please keep it in mind. There's an open invitation for all developers to contribute to this newsletter. The more there is people contributing to it, the more useful it will be. And uh, you must all remember that when we recently discussed how to fill in the gaps between the different uh, parts of the Hyperledger community, um, there was quite a bit of pointers to the newsletter as a possible means of bridging the gaps. So that only works if everybody makes an effort to consider what they might uh, contribute to the newsletter to make it richer and uh, make it more interesting to everyone. So, I forget who, is that Daniela who added the call for maintainers? Uh, no, that's me. Um, okay. So we're having, uh, we're having a call on the 22nd, which is next Thursday, uh, immediately after the, the TSC call. We're gonna do uh, an introduction to insights to show maintainers how to get more uh, information about their projects. And then uh, we're also gonna have a uh, discussion about um, David, help me out. We'll talk about what other resources people want, and then we can document that and put it into a guide that can include other demos, like the one you'll do around insights, or just you know explaining how to use different tools, processes, etc. Uh, um, so we love to hear from maintainers about what what sort of things you would find helpful to have more information about. Okay, there you go. And then uh, Daniela put the next agenda item in. Sure, good yeah. morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and just a quick reminder that Hyperledger Global Forum is coming. Uh, for those of you who submitted talks, thank you so much. You should have received your notifications. Uh, if you have any questions, please just reply back to the speaker email uh, that, that came through the CFP process um, or let us know if you're having any trouble doing that. Um, so for those of you who have uh, applied and got accepted. Congratulations. We're looking forward to getting you on the agenda. Um, we did have some project talks uh, that were accepted, which is great to see. And once again, this year, like we did last year in Phoenix, where we had a dedicated space, we had a physical space last year, but a dedicated space and time for the projects to be able to uh, talk about the work that they're doing, what has been going on, any updates, um, and do uh, ask me anything type of event. So we're going to have 15-minute uh, slots uh, for the, each project. Uh, we'll put the word out to the maintainers and the different project lists if we don't already have you on, on the agenda or we already don't have you as you, with your hands up that you want to participate. So once again, um, uh, Global Forum, if you go on the website, you find all the information, but it's going to be virtual in June. Um, and uh, please, if you don't see your project your, that you're a maintainer uh, for on the agenda, please let us know as well as soon. Uh, the agenda will be announced as on Tuesday next week. 
uh, but everybody should get their notifications. Uh, we're looking forward to it. Great, great content, um, really good talks um, that have been uh, selected. So um, thank you all for participating in that process. All right, thank you, Danina. I have to say, you know, uh, <laughs> referring back to the Global Forum last year, which was the last physical event I attended before the world uh, shut down due to COVID is kind of interesting. It feels like eons ago. It was a good event though. So hopefully we can have another good event, even though it'll be virtual. And uh, yeah, hopefully we, the next one will be physical again. We, uh, we shut it down. We were the last event that the Phoenix, that the uh, yes. convention center had. And there were discussions as to whether we should have it at all or not. And I'm glad we kept it because it worked out well. And there was quite a few attendees. It was a good event. And as far as I know, nobody got infected from that uh, attending that event. So it was worth it. Anyway, with that being said, let's move. Well, is there any other announcements anybody wants to insert at this point? All right. If not, let's move on to the quarterly reports. Um, so there are two things. We have the cactus report, which was already posted last week. I just put it back because we had uh, it, it had been posted shortly before the meeting and not everybody had a chance to look at it. So I wanted to get uh, everybody another chance to raise any point they want on this. And um, I didn't see in the comments anything specific calling for a discussion. So unless anybody raised their hand now, we will move forward. And uh, we are going to face a similar situation with Fabric, which was uh, just recently posted. I, I made a last minute edit to the agenda to add the link to it, but uh, I want to thank my colleague, Dave, uh, who posted it. And so I'll just carry it over to next week. And so we get the chance to discuss it next week if there is any any uh, point that need to be discussed by them. All right. So with that said, I mean, well, as you know, I do want to highlight, we are still missing reports from Quilt and Explorer. So I, uh, I will try to make a point of reaching out specifically. It seems like even my messages and my, you know, uh, attempt to to get people's attention on TSC mailing list as you know I've not been noticed so we need to contact people directly I guess to try and see if anybody can uh, step up and uh, produce the reports for us it's always a bit concerning when we don't get reports but um, Hopefully it's just because they haven't paid attention. It doesn't mean much, but like we've seen Fluid Borough, right? It was silent for a long time, but in fact, the project itself was very active, so. All right, with that further ado, I would like then to start the presentation. As I was saying earlier, there was a, a you know, I pointed out a couple of weeks ago, I think that, you know, I've extended the invitation that we have, uh, that we made to the, the all the other groups within uh, uh, Hyperledger to come and present to the TSE as a chance to, again, bridge the gaps between the different pieces within uh, different groups within Hyperledger. And uh, I extended that invitation to the labs as well. It's a bit more difficult because, you know, I don't have a mailing list I can send to everybody, but I did post it on the channel. And uh, in this case, my colleagues who had just posted the uh, the, the lab created, launched the lab uh, Weaver DLT interoperability, peak, you know, expressed interest in presenting to the TSC. So they'll be the first one to actually take advantage of that opportunity. So who is going to start the presentation? I have several of my colleagues from uh, IBM Research who have been involved in this project on the call. And, yeah, no, uh, yeah, this is Rama. So I'm going to be uh, doing the presentation. Very good. So, um, Rai, can you stop sharing so Rama can share his slides? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, before, uh, before sharing the slides, let me just quickly 
Should we? All right. So uh, thanks everyone. Thanks to Hyperledger TSC for giving me the chance to present. Uh, so we launched our project as a in the Hyperledger Labs uh, just about two weeks ago, and uh, thanks to uh, Arnold sponsorship. So we are calling this project Weaver. It's about DLT interoperability. Uh, we say DLT, not blockchain, because uh, we one of our uh, uh, initial target platforms was Corda, which is not strictly a blockchain. So, uh, but yeah, we, we generally want to enable interoperability of uh, uh, of various kinds between different uh, uh, networks. Primarily, we've been shooting at uh, permission networks, but uh, our vision is not restricted to just permission networks. We we do envision uh, uh, enabling uh, interactions between uh, among permission networks, between permission and permissionless networks and so on. So uh, please uh, feel free to go visit uh, our project here at uh, Hyperledger Labs Weaver DLT Interoperability. And uh, if you go over to the overview page, you should get a, uh, a high level overview of what this project is all about. And then uh, you'll find links to go into more details. So I'll show some of these in the presentation as well. All right. Okay. So, uh, hi, I'm uh, I'm Rama. By the way, I uh, I'm a member of the IBM Research Lab in India, and this project uh, is a uh, began as a collaborative effort between different researchers working in various IBM labs, primarily uh, India and Australia. And uh, we've been working on this for almost two years at this point. Uh, though the, the code base that we've checked in is a rather recent effort. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is first, uh, I'm going to cover the, uh, the why. What, what is it, uh, why we are, uh, uh, why we have this project, why we need it, uh, what, what drives us. Uh, and then I'll talk uh, briefly about the vision of this project, uh, uh, what, what are the use cases it encompasses, uh, our design that we have uh, implemented uh, as a proof of concept, and uh, what applications can be put to, and within uh, within this, I'll specifically talk about our early survey. Given have only uh, twenty minutes, uh, the data transfer across networks, and then I'll show how we enable data transfer between fabric networks as well as between fabric and corda networks. Uh, I'll give a snapshot of what our project roadmap is uh, at least for this year, and uh, towards the end, time permitting, just mention what we're up to right now, which is asset exchange across networks. So uh, why are we, why do we need interoperability? So uh, the past few years, uh, since we've had uh, emergence of permission networks, what we see is that uh, a lot of networks have been built of uh, limited scope and uh, limited uh, number of assets that they manage. Like you can have networks that are just doing IC, some networks that are just doing uh, insurance, some doing logistics, payments, and so on. Uh, the thing is, in the, in the real world, uh, a lot of activities that happen in one network don't just remain in that network. You may need information that resides on the ledger of one network to be used to drive the workflow in a different network. And I'll show you a use case later on, which involves global trade. Uh, but the thing is, the way these permission networks have emerged in the past few years, uh, you get uh, data and assets that are trapped inside these networks, even though needs to be a way for these networks to share the information in order to drive their workflows. Uh, within blockchains, and blockchains are created to enable distributed trust, right? A decentralized trust. Uh, what we want to do is to ensure that when uh, 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 two networks interoperate, uh, we want to ensure, provide similar levels of trust across network interaction as uh, uh, provided with the network today. So overall, what you want to do is to remove data and value silos, and this also enables us to uh, scale uh, uh, the vision of blockchain, so which is at this point like number of different islands uh, aggregated together. Uh, before going into what we are doing, uh, just uh, cover uh, what are the different views of what interoperability itself. Is. So not everyone necessarily agrees on what this word means uh, when it comes to blockchain networks. Or DLT networks, uh, some people imagine 
interoperability can be achieved by, let's say, shared peer among different networks. So if you have a peer that's common to different networks, uh, which is, uh, which therefore has, uh, is able to see the ledgers of those different networks, you can then write an application over that, running on, on that peer, that uh, collects the data from different networks, crunches it, and produces something that uh, does something useful. So it's sort of like an aggregator, but using this, a single peer as a conduit. But this, in effect, makes this one peer uh, sort of a trusted party for whatever it is we're trying to achieve. Not exactly, uh, it, it achieves a kind of interoperability, but that's not what uh, we're trying to achieve. Another view of interoperability is uh, uh, just ensuring that uh, peers uh, as part of the network are not restricted to one particular environment or one particular platform. So you could have uh, with one peer network running a common consensus protocol that uh, there are some peers lie on IBM SaaS, some on AWS, Oracle, and so on. Again, a valid uh, uh, vision, but uh, it's, it's a bit orthogonal to what we are trying to see. Uh, another way you can think of is uh, there are uh, existing uh, uh, blockchain networks, like uh, if you think of Adelens, which is uh, 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 maybe uh, driven by MERS, uh, they offer APIs sort of at a network level. You can imagine two networks sort of opening API, uh, APIs via REST endpoints, uh, allowing uh, information to flow between networks. But in effect, what we're doing here is uh, boiling down uh, the two, uh, network into a kind of a trusted spokesman or a proxy. Uh, that defeats the purpose of having a blockchain network in the first place. Uh, we want uh, any interaction between networks to be at the network to network level, not between any trusted proxies that are supposed to be speaking for the network. So that really is our vision of interoperability. We want to be able to exchange data and value across two networks uh, while preserving the tenets of distributed digital technology. And I'll just show what I mean by that in more detail. Uh, so our this vision is. Uh, or rather the spectrum of what we intend to cover, you can see in this diagram, uh, there are different stacks here. Uh, uh, some of these stacks uh, are, so you, can, you can imagine two different ledgers on a single network, like two different channels on fabric network. Uh, the interoperability uh, involves exchange of data and assets between those two ledgers, because uh, in the fabric design, you can have channels are meant to be isolated. Uh, then going one step further, you can imagine uh, data and values being exchanged between uh, uh, ledgers that are running on two existing networks, yet uh, running the same DLT protocol, that is, say, Fabric. It's a step uh, beyond, but again, given that the two networks are running Fabric, it's uh, we think it's somewhat tractable. So then further, we would also like to uh, ledger uh, information and assets on, uh, uh, on the ledger of one network and Fabric, say, with another with a ledger on another network that's running on Corda or Bazel. So there we see uh, we have uh, other challenges to handle. So there are different levels of uh, challenges that we uh, envision, and you can see this called out in the different layers. Uh, when it comes to different DLT protocols, we have to uh, wrap our heads around the how the finality is achieved in the different ledgers. When it comes to networks, you have to think about the different trust models that these networks uh, use at the ledger level. It's about what are the data models they're using, CXO account, et cetera. And at the contract levels, you have to think about uh, uh, governance and policies as well as the semantics of the data. Uh, and what cuts across the different levels are policy and governance as well as identity issues. Lastly, we also, we don't want to restrict interoperability just among DLT-based networks. You can think of uh, any information flowing from a uh, decentralized network to a, let's say, an ERP system also as falling the ambit of this policy. Uh, this is a diagram that uh, roughly meant to emulate the OSI stack. So you can see the concerns rising from just uh, sending bytes over the wire right up to policies and, and regulations at, at the top. So not just a technical matter. Uh, our focus at this point is primarily at the, what we call the semantic layer, where we are thinking not just about bytes uh, and where we are not exactly concerned about governance either. We're thinking in terms of uh, the, the objects and the, uh, uh, and the meaning of those objects that are uh, resident on different ledgers and how uh, one would need to uh, move them from one ledger to another while maintaining the properties of uh, 
whatever properties the contract want uh, want them to maintain. Uh, main challenge we see in DLT interoperability versus uh, traditional web service interoperability is the fact that uh, in traditional uh, the service world, um, you have a single party that is exposing service. Here, uh, in a DLT based network, uh, you can't just trust a single party. You can't just uh, assume that one peer speaks for the entire network or one proxy that's uh, layered above the peer network speaks for the network. Uh, given that uh, the shared ledger reflects the consensus view of a network, what we want when we get some information out of a network is consensus view. So that really is what we are trying to uh, strive for or what we need to strive for when it comes to uh, blockchain interoperability. Uh, uh, and that also the main challenge, how to ensure this kind of multi-party trust. So the way we, or, or rather the objectives we need to focus there are uh, uh, anything where we need to uh, verify the provenance of data as well as its uh, veracity and its authenticity. Uh, that requires some sort of, so in comparison to traditional API uh, based integration approaches, uh, we need to have not just data being communicated, but also some, uh, some kind of proof. And each of the proof may vary, but uh, at, a, at a very high level, that's what you need in, in common. Uh, another thing is uh, uh, the distinction between data and assets. So we, uh, we call assets are like a special class of data, some, something that's recorded on the ledger, but which has a self-bridge ownership. Uh, and at any point in time, the asset cannot be, you can't just make copies of the asset that is spread out while maintains its integrity. In other words, in, in, uh, in terms of uh, cryptocurrency, you don't want to spend that asset. So uh, there's a difference between data, which is something that you can copy, but whose provenance you need to verify, versus assets whose integrity you need to maintain by uh, having a, a specific ownership effect. Uh, that leads us to the three modes as uh, we envision them. And uh, in our view, these three roughly cover the space of blockchain interoperability. Uh, there's data transfer where uh, we, uh, there's some uh, data item or some information that's recorded in a uh, source ledger or source network that a consuming ledger or a destination network needs to use to drive its workflow. And uh, so you, uh, what we need is to be able to, uh, Build a mechanism whereby a network can transfer data to another network along with some assurance that the data is valid. And the receiving network must be able to verify that, uh, uh, that assurance, of course. Uh, asset exchange is about uh, atomic uh, exchange of assets in two different networks. So, uh, most of you uh, probably heard, know about the hash framework uh, contracts, uh, the HTLC mechanism whereby you can do atomic swaps across different networks. So, that's basically uh, the uh, the use case that uh, asset exchange is describing. Asset transfers uh, related to it, uh, you want to move an asset from one network to the other. That is, uh, an asset disappears from one network, appears another network. Again, both exchange and transfer, these have to happen in atomic. So that's the difference between this and the data transfer use case. So uh, I'll just give a, a brief overview of, of Beaver. I know I have uh, probably five minutes more, so I'll try to keep it short. Uh, we have a bunch of design principles that uh, we build the solution on. One, uh, and just to run through this quickly, we don't want to uh, tie mechanisms to a particular DLT. We want to make sure that the different networks that are interoperating retain their sovereignty. Uh, we uh, are they, um, maintain control over their governance. Uh, keep the trust footprint to the minimum. Uh, not uh, and not increase any uh, trust footprint. That uh, a DLT network already possesses. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, any communication between networks is kept uh, private and confidential as much as possible. Uh, and most important, we do not want uh, to have any intermediaries. That is either some sort of a trusted proxy or uh, some sort of a third party platform that, uh, into which you know you can plug inside. That's the approach that's been taken by a uh, system like uh, Corda or Polkadot. So what we want is to enable peer-to-peer -peer ad hoc interoperation between networks. And uh, we also, uh, again, engineering concerns, we don't want to allow uh, or require any changes in the underlying DLT platform. Whatever we do, we do it in the application layer or we do it through any plugins that are allowed by the system. Uh, when any network that already exists, any applications already running on a 
uh, on a private network or quarter network, we don't want to impact its legacy operation. We want to, uh, uh, if necessary, we will adapt it a little bit to allow that uh, application to uh, use uh, the capabilities that we were providing, but we don't want to force the developers to make any uh, changes there. Uh, this is the triangle is describing our three broad use cases as a transfer, data transfer, as an exchange. And uh, what you see here is this is the high level vision. Networks communicate with each other for a particular use case via a, a module that we call the relay. So the relay is a component that's owned and maintained securely by a network. It's, it's owned by the network's governance rules. And that's something that we use to uh, uh, ensure communication. So just uh, uh, going into what exactly our protocol does. So this is the uh, data transfer protocol, which was uh, one of the first use case that we chose. And uh, we have a uh, data transfer protocol that's been uh, implemented. And if you look at our current code base, you will see uh, uh, the components as well as uh, uh, a framework for testing and demonstration of, uh, uh, of data transfer between networks. What's going on here? So uh, this is like fabric network, hyperledge fabric network. The parts in green are the component additional components that we add. So as I mentioned, we have a component called the relay, which is supposed to be uh, a, 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 a DLT independent appliance that any network can use. Uh, into that, we can plug in certain drivers that understand how this particular DLT works. Like it understands how fabric works and it's able to drive uh, transactions to fabric network. So that's a uh, difference between relay and driver. Uh, we try to keep it modular. Uh, we have some SDKs and libraries that applications can use to, uh, to make queries and receive responses. And within the networks, what we have are uh, this is effectively called an interoperation module. And this, by consensus, performs certain functions uh, related to uh, uh, parsing requests as well as parsing uh, responses. What's happening? I'll just show in a second. This, by the way, uh, looks like a mirror image, but this is a quarter network which has uh, similar components, it has relay and drivers, it has uh, uh, these uh, contracts or interoperation module that performs uh, functions that are common to all the peers. And it also has SDK and libraries running for that that's installed here. So uh, just to go through go real quick, the, the application in one network sends a query. What, what is it seeking? It's seeking information from this other network, uh, which happens to be on this network's ledger. It goes through relays, and what is being sent is a query for some data item along with the verification policy. What the verification policy says is, that I uh, will trust the information if you provide proof of a certain standard, and that is described in this policy. Uh, the relay then figures out uh, through its drivers how to then take this information along the proof. So what it does, in effect, it uh, sends the request, submits it to the, to the network, and this network. Uh, it has to first do access control it, uh, because a network does not uh, necessarily want to share its information to anyone. So there, there are access control policies that can maintain on the shared ledger. Uh, so the access control rules are also enforced uh, via the regular contract mechanism uh, in order to enforce through a flow. Uh, so we, uh, the, an ACL policy is uh, once it passes the ACL check, it mandates attestations over data. So you have multiple uh, that are generating signatures over uh, the data. And finally, we also uh, encrypt the data as well as the attestation. So, because what we want is uh, for the relays, which are only semi trusted in our framework, to not get access to the uh, actual answer or the signatures which they can exfiltrate from the party. So, this goes back to the relay and goes back to the client, which can then decrypt the information along with the proof, which is the set of attestations. And then uh, it submits a transaction with uh, the information it got from this foreign ledger. And uh, this network, via its own contracts, can verify that uh, information. So each peer verifies the proof that accompanies the data before that transaction is submitted. So just as a use case of this uh, scenario, uh, uh, let me just show you this global trade use case. Uh, we have a trade logistics network. Okay? Roughly loosely inspired by trade lens, and we have a trade finance network loosely inspired by 
uh, Marco Polo, which is running on Corda, or uh, Trade running on, on Fabric. So we have uh, implementations uh, uh, that, that can demonstrate this. So uh, the Trade Finance Network runs a letter of credit workflow. Uh, what it needs uh, finally is it needs a bill of lading to drive a payment obligation from the buyer's bank to the seller's bank. On the Trade Logistics Network, what it's managing is it's managing consignment shipping. So uh, seller generates some goods and uh, dispatches to carrier, and the carrier is generating a bill of lading. Now, uh, what we have is we can identify two points of interoperation here. Uh, one is the uh, uh, shipper uh, is not willing to uh, dispatch goods without uh, uh, knowledge of a letter of credit. So the network here can, via an interoperation channel, obtain a letter of credit that was created in the trade finance network. And finally, towards the end, when the bill of lading is created in the logistics network, uh, this the trade finance network, in order to enforce a payment obligation, can fetch the bill of lading from the logistics network. So this can be done via the protocol that we uh, told. So that's it. I uh, I think I'm almost out of time, right? Uh, how much time do I have left? Uh, you can take another five minutes, but uh, try to not take too okay. much longer because I suspect there may be some questions. So, sure, sure, I'll I'll try to wrap up. Uh, so this is our uh, overall roadmap, and uh, you can find this in our repository. So I'm not going to go into the details of this. Uh, yeah, suffice to say that uh, in uh, the fall of last year, we created version what we call we version one point two, and that enabled data transfer between two fabric networks as well as between fabric and quarter networks. And uh, that's what, uh, if you visit our project repository, you can, you can play with that. Uh, and uh, also we have a, a few research papers as well as articles that you can find links to in the, the overview document. Uh, later, end of this year, uh, we refactored our code uh, to conform to a certain set of RFCs that we had been working on in the middle of last year. And we envisioned these RFCs as providing the basis for standardization. So this is actually the code that you're going to find in the uh, repository right now. And at present, we are trying to, uh, uh, we, are at, uh, we are trying to augment our protocol suite by adding uh, uh, support for asset exchanges using the HTLC pattern uh, between two different networks. Our immediate targets are, are to enable uh, asset exchange between fabric networks and also between a fabric and a Bezo network. And uh, we're going to be demonstrating that using a delivery versus payment use case. So uh, just to talk about this at a high level, uh, you already know this pretty well, but uh, what we want to uh, achieve here is, given that uh, party X and party Y both have accounts on two different networks, uh, X owns asset M in one network, Y owns asset N in the other, this is what we want to achieve is that uh, Y gets M from X and X gets uh, N from Y. The two different networks, but these have to happen atomically. So either both transfers happen or neither does. And uh, this is our uh, mechanism. You can actually, if you visit our RFCs, you will see the flow diagram there. Uh, and uh, for a demonstration use case, we are going to target uh, a bond exchange in one network uh, that's maintaining bonds uh, to different commercial banks. In exchange for uh, payment uh, via uh, some central bank digital currency in a CBDC network. So the steps here you see are correspond to the hash time of contract steps, where we create a uh, we lock an asset in one network using a using a particular hash whose secret is known only to the locker, and uh, 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 the other party then uses the same hash to lock asset in another network, and then the first party makes a claim on this network, and uh, by revealing the secret. And then the second party can then claim uh, its, uh, its reward or, uh, or the other uh, or the exchange asset on the other network by using the same secret. So this is what we're trying to achieve in this uh, in the use case. Uh, so uh, keep watching out for page to go. So yeah, I'll take questions if there are any, and if you have time. All right, thank you, Rama. I know it's a bit of a challenge to cover that much in so little time, but uh, you did a pretty good job. So thank you. I suspect it went a bit too fast for some, but uh, so please, does anybody have any questions? Uh, 
Uh, maybe you did a good job, but mm, nobody has questions. Either they are lost or you already answered all their questions. Yeah, feel free to ask any questions, uh, and you know uh, you can do that on. Uh, yeah, and and please do visit our labs repo. Look at the code. Uh, if you want to contribute, great. Uh, if you see any issues, issues, and you know you can have a dialogue there. All right, Brian is on. Yeah, um, maybe a question uh, as much for uh, folks involved with Cactus here as others. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know if you've looked at Cactus uh, uh, and the work going on there, but how do you compare it to it? Do you see the possibility of uh, combining efforts in some way? Yeah, so uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, uh, we have been in talks with uh, you know, the Cactus folks uh, the past few months. Uh, we were, uh, we've been thinking about uh, how to effectively enforce it or at least uh, share some information. And uh, uh, we haven't settled on anything at this point yet, but what we felt was that the uh, approaches are sufficiently different, even though I I'll say that uh, the, uh, uh, the motivation as well as a lot of the use cases, it's a thing we can overlap. And also the fact that Cactus also envisions uh, enabling peer to peer interoperability among networks rather than using uh, some sort of shared infrastructure like Cosmos or Polkadot. Those are the similarities I see. Uh, once you go a, a level deeper, there are significant differences in terms of uh, and philosophy as well as uh, system architecture. But uh, we are in touch with them and uh, the dialogue that we would have over the next few months. Yeah, indeed. And you know, we had a few calls where we actually talked with several people from the Cactus team, and uh, I see Peter Hart there on, and um, I mean. The idea was, you know, the, the sense from the IBM team is that it's different enough that we cannot just, you know, pretend we can just merge those two things, It'd probably end up with the Frankenstein kind of monster that nobody would like. But uh, there are at the same time some similarities. And the idea was that once the code is available, because we, you know, it has only been recently open sourced. Um, the Cactus team would have a chance to really dive into it and we could continue the conversation and see if there are at least some modules that could be uh, you know, uh, uh, shared between the two projects. And so I, I don't know if the, you know, some of the people from the Cactus team have had a chance already to look into it. Maybe Peter, I know he was eager to see the code. I don't know if he has any opinion at this point. I took a peek, but uh, I haven't been able to do a deep dive just yet. It's been uh, crazy busy, but uh, mm -hmm. that's definitely on uh, my to-do list to to read the code back to back and then formulate more opinions. All right, totally understand. Yeah. All right, so if there is no other further questions, I guess we'll be done with this for now. Thank you. Thank you, Rama, for presenting. And uh, I think, yeah, you're welcome. I mean, obviously this is one of those projects that by nature, you know, kind of like cross uh, different technology spaces. And I think could be of interest to quite a few people and not, you know, it's not just an addition to fabric or something along the lines, so. Um, so let's continue with the agenda then. So we've talked about it quite extensively several times. Uh, there is an open issue on the, um, uh, you know, the proposal to eliminate the lab sponsor requirements. So today to have, a, you know, to submit, a, to, to get your, proposal for creating a lab, you must have a sponsor on the limited number of people qualified to be a sponsor. I'm not going to redo the whole discussion, but you know, I felt like, okay, I put a proposal together. There's been a bit of back and forth. I feel like everybody should understand now the pros and cons. It's not perfect necessarily, but you know, at the end of the day, I think it was Gary who commented, um, and basically said, yeah, the, you know, I trust that the stewards know uh, what this entails. 
And if they're okay with it, I'm fine with this. Sounds like a reasonable uh, proposal. So I, uh, I think we should make a decision and uh, decide one way or another, but just get over with it. So is there any questions from anyone? Any comments? Um, hey, Arno, just to be clear, we have total support from the lab stewards for this, right? Well, uh, we'll find out. <laughs> I mean, the lab stewards are basically on. I mean, yes, I, I think, you know, I mean, Tracy has expressed, you know, herself before. Unfortunately, she's not here today to vote. I, I thought she would, but, uh, you know, nobody has objected to it that I know of. Because as I said, at the end of the day, the, you know, even you have uh, expressed there are anecdotal evidence to where the sponsor has actually played a role and having this requirement has allowed lab people to connect with some people in the community. But for the most part, uh, it's only used as a filtering mechanism, which the stewards already provide. So the stewards have affirmatively said they're okay with this. I don't want to pretend I know the absolute answer from everybody who is a steward. So, but I, yeah, they have not said no that I know of. I think the only reason that's important is because the, the responsibility for making sure the labs are going well then falls on the steward. I mean, I know the sponsors weren't necessarily, you know, active in their oversight role or their guidance role. Um, but if the stewards are comfortable removing a layer of indirection, <laughs> removing a layer of, uh, uh, um, you know, that, that uh, you know, uh, that and being directly responsible for, for the labs, um, then I, I, I can't see a reason to object to it. Uh, so but it just it can, adds some work to the stewards. Yes, no, so that I, I can clearly, you know, address that point. The lab stewards do not rely on the sponsors to do any of this because we know that sponsors don't. <laughs> They've never been made responsible for that. There were discussions at different points in time about what, how much the sponsors were expected to do. And the reality is, you know, it's extremely limited. And it's at the discretion of the sponsors if they want to do it uh, more, but in no way, shape or form, the stewards can rely on the sponsors to do any kind of real handholding past the point of, you know, the submission proposal. The, the proposal submission, I should, sorry. So. So I guess what I'm going at, for me to be comfortable voting yes on this, I want to hear a steward say, yes, this is a good idea. I am one. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> and I've served as sponsor on more lab proposal that I should have. Because, and, and I always felt, well, I'm doing this job twice mm -hmm. as a steward and as a sponsor. Why am, we do we do this? And when I say, and honestly, I have volunteered sometimes just, you could kind of like out of pity because I could see there were interesting proposals put on the table and the people were just not able to get a sponsor. And I didn't want to always volunteer, but you know, you're like, okay, let's just get it done. Put me a sponsor, let's move forward. And I don't know, we don't have any evidence that this was ever detrimental to Hyperledger in any way. Any other questions? Bobby? Bobby? My only concern, I agree, not having um, the sponsors is a great idea and it eases up on the pressure for the people who are organizing the labs. But I, the only piece I don't want to go away is the maintainers and the TSC looking for new projects and feeling because they're not a sponsor, they can't bring them to the labs. Wait, I'm not sure I'm following your point there, Bobby. So I was a sponsor for a project and I brought it to the labs and then Tracy took it over and ran with it. Um, and now if that sponsor piece goes away for me, I don't, or for us, I don't want the people who are hearing great presentations just because they're no longer a lab sponsor to feel that they can't 
you know, reach out to you or Tracy, the lab sponsor, or the lab stewards and say, I have this great project. You want to go look at it? Let's see if it fits. Because I think that's important, that funnel. And I don't want just because the TSC and the maintainers are no longer lab sponsors to think that they can't introduce projects. Yes, uh, no, absolutely. This is definitely not the intent. It's, it's definitely not to block anything. It's to help bring in more things, if anything. Uh, um, you know, one proposal I had was to not remove the role of lab sponsor necessarily, but to remove it as a requirement for a lab proposal, which means we could even still have it in the template and people could fill this out if they happen to have one. Uh, but you know, it's it's not a must. Have. So we would the stewards would still accept proposals that don't have a sponsor. And in fact, the proposal would still stand as, because it says eliminate lab sponsor requirement, which is you know um, not necessarily the same as removing the role. Then I agree. Thank you. Anyone else? Do you want to call for a vote? You'll need to find a second. Yeah, I would like somebody to second it if they're agreeing. Arun, oh, welcome. Hey, so um, how do we decide the, the team like the, for example, the stewards. How how do we decide that stewards are like, for example, if if we have a sponsor, then they will look at the project and they will understand the project. They will they will have their pitch as well in in the proposal. So if we eliminate that, and then how how do we streamline that process by with the pitchers? So I, again, I think, you know, I, so the stewards, I mean, you know, we see, I mean, technically speaking, people submit a proposal by doing a pull request where there's a small page which follows a template that is provided that basically asks them, okay, what is this about? And, you know, who is involved in this? Who would be the, the primary, you know, the, the, the initial contributors? Committers, and then there is a question as to whether there's an existing repo that they want to bring in, and then there's this question: Do you have a lab sponsor? Who is it? And um, so the today the stewards when they receive this, they review it. Sometimes, I mean, you know, we say, "Sorry, this is not clear. You need to explain this." Or, "Do you know about this project? Have you talked to them?" We can do try to do a bit of coordination, uh, you know look for opportunities to, to connect the dots with other existing projects. And um, we make sure that this is, you know, this is clarified and it makes sense. Sometimes we have to ask them to change the title to make it more, you know, meaningful. And, and then we simply ask the sponsor to confirm that they are sp sponsor for the proposal. And the sponsor just says, yeah, and based on that, if there is two stewards that have said yes, the proposal is approved. So there's really not that much to it. I want to be clear. And, um, and we've seen proposals that got stuck because they've gone everything else, but we tell them, well, you need a sponsor. And they say, we don't have one, where do I find one? And we've been through this exercise many times where this issue was brought up to the TSC we look for uh, volunteers. We look for a way to, you know, set up a list of sponsors from which people can, you know, uh, find names and, and reach out to, to try and get them to enroll as sponsor. We don't have anybody volunteering. So that's, you know, in fact, you know, I, was, I feel like if you oppose this, you should by, by default, you know, volunteer to be a sponsor because I think it's a bit unfair to say, you need a sponsor, but just don't come to me. There's a very limited set of people who can qualify a sponsor. 
and it makes it an unfair you know, requirement in my opinion. So does that address your question, Arun? I don't know if you're talking about the process streamlining. I think it's pretty streamlined from that point of view. Okay. So we'll keep still the field, just that we make it optional for now. We can definitely keep it on the, uh, on the yes, on the form, on the template. Sounds good. Art. I'll say also say I went back and looked at some of the original discussion. One of the reasons we had a lab sponsor was to try to make it harder for people to start labs that we wanted people to have like some connection to Hyperledger. I think this like there's I believe a Chris Ferris thing that like well we don't want labs to you know to be totally unrelated to Hyperledger. Um, but I think kind of our thinking has changed like that, which has changed around this and that sort of now we think uh, labs are like a good avenue for people outside of Hyperledger to sort of join the community. Um, so if, if we sort of accept that rationale, then, then making the lab sponsor go away makes perfect sense. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, anyone else for a second? Can second the motion so we can have a vote? Uh, no. Dave, I'll second. Yeah, I'll second. Okay, thank you. All right, so does anybody want to object? Does I hear none? Does anybody want to abstain? No? All right, so this passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, we'll update the documentation accordingly and we'll keep it, uh, we'll keep the, the, the sponsor, you know, uh, field in the form. We'll just not make it a requirement for people, for proposals to be accepted. All right, thank you. Oh, we're almost out of time. I didn't think we would spend so much time. Oh, well, uh, let's see. Well, I guess we'll stop at this then. There's four minutes left, there's not enough. What I wanted to do, and, and we'll keep, I'll keep trying, obviously we have the presentation now. So we, it took quite a bit of time, but I think it was, I hope you agree it was time well spent. And uh, what I want to do moving forward is go back to the decision blog and do a little bit of housekeeping. I think there are some entries there that can be probably disposed of and just say, you know, we withdraw them or some I think are kind of dependent on others and could be disposed of or, you know, pending resolution on some others. So for instance, there are, you know, several entries regarding um, how projects evolve, how we review them, if they've derailed from their charter and stuff like this. I think some of this can be addressed once we have like badging proposal, which provides us with like this ongoing review process. And um, so I'm hoping that we can kind of close some of the related issues. So, with that, I think unless anybody else has anything else they want to bring up now, I'm going to give you back two minutes and close the call on this. As call. Another the Rama. Real, I just wanted to mention that uh, uh, we had a proposal accepted at the Hyperledger Global Forum. So if you're interested in finding out more about interoperability and challenges that lie ahead, uh, please do turn to that. Uh, okay, that, that's a good point. I mean, I don't know, you were breaking up a bit. So I, I, Rama is just advertising that there are sessions related that uh, to interoperability at the global forum. So if you haven't heard, 
I hope this clarifies. So look for those uh, sessions if you're interested in that topic. All right, let's close on this. Thank you all for joining. We'll talk again next week.